Welcome to Spotlight. I'm Ryan Keating. Today we're sitting in the home of one of the first ladies of jazz. Please welcome Marion McPartland. Hi, Ryan. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you for having us today. I'm really looking forward to this chat. Oh, me too. Especially hearing about your early life in Ireland <laughs> and all that stuff. You know, we got our life histories together before we even <laughs> did the interview. Well, it always helps. <laughs> I know. Now, it's been said that you taught yourself to play the piano by ear at a very early age. Oh, it's been said, and it's true. It's true. My mother was quite a good pianist. She used to play a lot from the music. She played mm -hmm. a lot of Chopin. And, uh, you know, I was just a little kid hanging around listening to this, three, about three years old. And, uh, you know, I guess kids are impressionable at that age, and I decided it was something I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I just climbed up on the stool. We had a round, one of those round, old-fashioned stools, and she put cushions on it, and I would sit there and try to imitate her. That's how I got started. And, and uh, uh, it just seems as if I've been playing as long as I can remember. Uh, it, it appears in the research that I did that there was a great Uncle Harry who had a yellowed keyboard that oh you Oh my God, you got all that stuff. <laughs> well, my great Uncle Harry and his brothers lived in Windsor, my other great uncles. And one was a cellist, and Uncle Harry uh, owned a jewelry store shop, which his relatives still own. They're jewelers to the royal family. Mm -hmm. And uh, Harry Di Uncle Harry Dyson and I used to go down there and stay. Um, and I think it's probably one of the first pianos I ever played on. And it really, it would have been great for Liberace, you know, with, with um, orange-colored silk in the panels uh -huh. and candelabra and kind of yellow keys. It probably wasn't even in tune, but I was <laughs> too young to know. But I can see it as if it was yesterday. It is highly polished, beautiful old piano. I I wish I had it today as a, as a museum piece, you know. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sure. It must be beautiful. Yeah. Uh, so your parents were very influential on you musically. Well, uh, in a sense, they were probably influential but by not doing much, you mm -hmm. know. They didn't. Uh, I often wondered why my mother didn't insist that I take piano lessons. In fact, I was one child that asked to have piano lessons. And they said... Uh, no, we think you should learn the violin because uh, you have violin fingers, whatever that may mean. So they went out and bought a violin and got me a violin teacher and I learned the violin, but I never liked it. Not well, it might be the old adage, never say no to your child. They probably wanted you to learn piano all along. <laughs> well, I'm so glad they did say no. I'm, I'm glad it was, I mean, in a sense, I'm glad they said no to some things. Otherwise, I mm -hmm. probably would be more unbearable than I am anyway. But... Uh, as I think about it now, it might have been a wise move because they could have gone the other way and um, turned me into some kind of prodigy mm -hmm. where I would just have been playing piano and never done anything else. As it was, I just sort of gravitated to jazz. And uh, I did finally go to the Guildhall School of Music for about mm -hmm. three years. And then I did a lot of catching up on the classics. But jazz was always my first love. At what age did you start actually playing playing the piano or taking lessons rather? Um, I think I was about 16 or 17 and I actually got a scholarship. So that's relatively late. Yeah, oh yeah. I mean I was uh, I was already, I mean I was playing little pieces that I could sort of slowly read from having learned uh, the notes to play the violin. Mm -hmm. That's the only way I could ever read at all. At least Thank goodness for that. <laughs> but when I got to the Guild Hall, then I really did cram, and uh, I took uh, composition and piano and violin for second instrument and class singing and singing, and uh, I was just busy morning till night. That was really my teenage life was spent there. And my father used to s say when I would come home, doesn't she ever do anything else but practice? <laughs> I'm here <laughs> muttering. Well, I'm sure it's better than getting into trouble and other things. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I got into trouble later. <laughs> well, as long as you got into trouble. <laughs> uh, what awakened your interest in jazz? Was it something that you had always loved? or Because it seems you had studied the classics prior to jazz. Well, I always listened to everything I heard. You know, they're, um, on the BBC, they had pretty much 
the same music that was heard in America, all the American composers, and I think the big bands tried to sound a lot like the American bands. Mm -hmm. I just absorbed every piece of music, sort of by osmosis. I know thousands of tunes that I've never ever seen the music to. Um, and then I had a boyfriend who, he started out dating my sister, but she wasn't too interested in jazz, and he uh -huh. had a big jazz collection of records, and so he sort of gravitated to me, and I loved the records, Duke Ellington and uh, Benny Goodman, and uh, that's really how I got started, really being an avid jazz mm -hmm. fan, and wanting to copy everything I heard off the records, and trying to, Teddy Wilson and Joe Sullivan, all the fine piano. Uh, you had said that you did attend the London Guild Hall, and um, there was one reference in my research, swinging the classics at the Guild Hall while keeping the eye on the door for the teacher. Now, could you just elaborate a little on this? Well, I think there was one record I owned that belonged to Hazel Scott, and she went, uh, years ago, she went through a, a phase, to, she was a very fine pianist and entertainer, and mm -hmm. she, she did a whole uh, series of albums and I, I think that was what it was called, sort of swinging the classics. And she did some Chopin, and I thought this was the greatest thing I'd ever heard. And and I would be trying to do that and, and play things I'd heard on our Tatum records, all behind closed doors of the practice room, or so I thought. Uh -huh. <laughs> and my professor, who was a very dignified, white-haired gentleman, his name was Orlando Morgan, and... Um, I didn't realize he had opened the door and was listening, and finally he hollered, Stop playing that trash! You know, I got red, and I was uncomfortable, mm -hmm. and, uh, but it was too late, I couldn't stop. So after a while I left and went out with a four piano, actually a vaudeville group. Mm -hmm. It didn't please my parents too much. So you toured the provinces? Yes. And how did you find that? I'm sure you got an education in life. It was really something I'm... I'm proud to have done now that it's all over because a lot of those theaters have been torn down and some of them were really landmarks. They should, mm -hmm. they should never have been torn down. But uh, uh, my <laughs> parents really didn't think too much <laughs> of that. But you know, talk about seeing life, yes, indeed, one did. And, uh, of course, traveling all over the country and... Um, uh, working in some pretty rickety old theaters and some of the pit bands were not the greatest because at that time I thought everything I was doing was, was the greatest. You know. I was just enthralled by all of it. Well I think naivety helps to some degree. I think so. I sure was naive, that's for sure. One thing I wanted to ask you was I'm sure that was a time given your social background and your family's position where it might have been expected of you to get married and have a family and not run off and tour the provinces. Oh, that's true. So that's did you find true. a lot of conflict that way? Um, well, of course, my parents were making these dire predictions. Oh, you'll come to no good. You'll <laughs> marry a musician and live in an attic. And that's pretty much what happened mm -hmm. eventually. And of course, all my boyfriends prior to meeting Jimmy, they weren't really... I don't think it was anybody my parents really approved of. But um, yeah, this was true of my sister, too. She just was a different kind of a person. She didn't, uh, you know, she didn't care. I sort of worried a lot that I wasn't uh, madly in love with a guy that my parents would mm -hmm. like, too. But it's, it still didn't deter me. I just went ahead anyway. And then, of course, I did marry Jimmy. And uh, they wound up liking him after they met him. They... Well, you gave him the good housekeeping seal. Mm. <laughs> well, you met him in Belgium, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, well, that was during World War II, and I was in USO cap shows. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was in special service, and they, we were sort of put together in this little band playing for the uh, troops in the front lines. It was, that was kind of exciting. How did you come about to actually getting into the uh, camp shows? Well, I was with ENSA, which was like the English version of USO. Mm -hmm. And uh, some girlfriends of mine who were singers said, well, why don't you join USO? You'll, you'll meet all these Americans and it pays <laughs> more money and stuff like that. And I, of course, I thought that would be great. So 
so I did. I don't know why they sent shows over and they expect to find piano players in England, mm -hmm. but they did. And uh, luckily, I was able to fill the bill, play for all the acts, and uh, uh, do my solo spot. And so then, later on, that's how Jimmy and I met. And um, then I worked with this little group, which was comprising uh, a bass player and drummer, two GIs, and Jimmy. Mm -hmm. and and some other ones, if we could find them, clarinet or trombone, whatever musicians we could scare up. <laughs> and uh, that was really exciting. And uh, then at the end of the war, Jimmy got his discharge over there. And then we had another show before we came back to the States with Celeste Holm, mm -hmm. uh, which was a great experience. I love her, and I still see her once in a great while. She was just starting out as a big star at that time. So occasionally she and I sit down and hash things over. Well, I'm sure that's terrific. Yeah. Uh, I've certainly been fortunate enough never to have to go through a war such as a world war. One thing I want to ask you is uh, how did it change your perception of humanity and what you wanted to do with your life? Did it have any bearing on what you finally did with your, with your career? I don't. I don't think so, Ryan. As a matter of fact, in a way, I felt sort of guilty because it was a, it's a, the war is so terrible, and you know, we, in a way, we were having a good time because we were enjoying playing for the troops who were, just loved the show, mm -hmm. and because it was great for them, uh, great therapy for them, and it was great for us. Um, I don't think I realized just how terrible everything was until it was over. I sort of did a, did a double take years later, seeing it all in my mind and thinking, what a terrible waste. And how can anybody ever contemplate doing a thing like that again with worse weapons and uh, getting into the terrible things? Well, I don't even want to go into that, but um, I don't think I'd be able to do that again, to go into USO uh, in a war-torn country like that and, and just feel good about it. I having fun like I was then, getting married, and you know it's kind of ridiculous when you think about it. Well, I think you always have a clearer pers perspective once it's over and done with. I think the way things happened, it just seemed like um, um, you know we got married, and then we came over here, and I worked with Jimmy, and things just kept going so fast. And then Jimmy said, "Oh, you ought to have your own trio." And uh, he pretty much created a monster because mm -hmm. I started my own trio and I've had that ever since for mm -hmm. years and years. I mean, not the same trio, different people. But uh, I guess I've been working steady ever since. How did, you no find how did you find coming to this country after being raised in England? Did you find there was much of a culture shock? Um, no. No, it, I, I, I don't think so. Not not that much, or I, I, I don't know, I've been somebody who's able to kind of settle into any environment. I think be, being mm -hmm. in Bonneville got me started. <laughs> I think I learned how to settle into any kind of situation. That's something certain people always say about me, that it that doesn't matter what situation I'm, I'm in or who I'm with, I can be comfortable, and I think mm -hmm. that's true. Well, you settled into Chicago, which must have been jazz in its real heyday. It, it's funny. I was, I was always like a kid let out of a kid in a candy store because all these people I'd read about and listened to, and here I was meeting them in person and getting to play with some of them. You know, like hearing Woody Herman on records, mm -hmm. and meeting him, Duke Ellington, and then having Art Tatum come to hear me play. I mean, that was just that was a terrible shock, but it was exciting and. It's always been a very kind of a humbling experience mm -hmm. for me. I've, I've always taken it as something that I'm very lucky to have, is having known so many of the great jazz people and knowing them now, Teddy Wilson and George Shearing, Oscar Peterson. Well, you've been Everybody. very blessed. Um, you had taken your trio to New York, and you were a staple for eight years or so in the Hickory Room. Yes, how, did you, how would you compare the jazz <laughs> scene in New York to Chicago? Was there much of a difference? Um, 
I don't know how to explain. There probably was. I mean, they have all these things, like they call something West Coast Jazz mm -hmm. in Chicago. And of course, Chicago Jazz is, I think, thought of, I think you think more of traditional jazz when you think of Chicago Jazz. Um, it's hard to define all the different eras of jazz. It's traditional jazz or, or Dixieland, and then when I was there, something called progressive jazz was getting started, and George Shearing was making a big name for himself. And I remember we worked with Billy Eckstein and Sarah Vaughan when they were just starting out. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to differentiate. Uh, then we came to New York, and, and bebop was starting, and I seemed like I was always catching up, you know, I'd just get something under my fingers and mm -hmm. it would all move, then it would be at whatever was avant-garde, I don't know, whatever was avant-garde then, it isn't anymore. Well, I know there was a Mary Lou Williams who was very influential on your, your playing. Oh, Mary Lou was probably, if you have to say, actually say, say a woman player, for, she transcended that, she was just one of the great players of all time, and composers, and somebody that had a great influence on me. Mm -hmm. was a very strong person, a great musician, and somebody who did her own thing her whole life, nothing stopped her. She was just terrific. Did you find it hard coming to Chicago, being a British white woman, and trying <laughs> to break into the jazz field? <laughs> well, I think I was fortunate because of Jimmy, and... Um, it wasn't like being alone and sitting by the phone, waiting for the phone to ring. Mm -hmm. I've heard some stories from some women who have said, I don't think it happens anymore, but years ago it might have happened where uh, they, they'd rather call a guy for, the, for a job than uh -huh. have to call a woman musician. But I, see, I was all in the position of either working with Jimmy, but then when I started my own trio, I was doing the hiring. So... I was able to call up the guys, and I always wanted the best people around. Mm -hmm. And luckily for me, I think I had them. I had a wonderful drummer years ago, Joe Morello, and Bill Crow on bass, and I had Jake Hanna, oh, many names. In fact, I've got a dream. I must do this one of these days. I want to have a party for all the bass players and drummers <laughs> that I've worked with through the years. You know, it would be a, that would be a big crowd. Oh, I'm sure. If I had to pay them all, I'd have to mortgage the house or something. <laughs> <laughs> you started your own record company. Yes. And how, mm -hmm. how did that evolve? Well, it was, I think it was about 1970, and I was sort of disenchanted with not recording. I'd recorded several albums for Capitol mm -hmm. and, and uh, Savoy and other labels, and there was a sort of a slump in... Not really a slump, but it seemed like only the real big name people were getting recorded, like Miles Davis. Mm -hmm. So it seemed as if the only thing to do was do it yourself. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had some friends help me, and I thought I'd just try to put out one record. And I had somebody design the cover, and I wanted to have this name, Halcy, and I loved the word. Uh -huh. And the, the label design, I just went ahead and did it. And uh, then it was sort of became something so interesting I couldn't give it up. And a friend of mine who has since passed away, Sherman Fairchild, he put some, he just had a lot of money, he put some money into the record company. And uh, then he died, and so I had to sort of go it alone. And uh, I still have the record company, but I'm recording mostly for Concord Jazz. Mm -hmm. So Halcyon is sort of lying fallow, but by no means out of the business. At what point did you start composing? Because I've known you've written songs with uh, Johnny Mercer and... Yeah, that was a big thrill. Have John, Johnny Mercer write a lyric for me. Um, oh, that was years ago. That was actually at the Hickory House. And one of the big publishers of that time, Jack Robbins, encouraged me to write. And uh, I never was that confident about my own writing, but he did give me confidence. And, and I have had a few nice songs recorded, well, Sarah Vaughan recorded one, and uh, Tony Bennett recorded mm -hmm. one, because um, I would love to have something that would be a hit, but it's hard to write for today's market, you know, I just have to write things I feel like, so I probably never will have a hit. How do you feel uh, 
the jazz of the 40s and 50s has influenced the music that we hear today? Well, I'm sure it's influenced it a lot, although there's such a big um, difference between rock and jazz. It's, it's too bad because they've sort of swung over to one side and it se seems as if uh, rock sort of separates generations somewhat, mm -hmm. whereas jazz seems to bind them together more. You find a lot of people, the parents like jazz and the kids like jazz, and that's always great. But um, there's been a big uh, mingling of the different kinds of music. I mean, you can hear a lot of uh, rock ideas in jazz, and, uh, and I think a lot of jazz in some rock pieces. I mean, a lot of things I really like. And you can, you can even take a... a Michael Jackson bass line and improvise uh -huh. on that. You know, you, all kinds of things you can do. Uh, do you, um, you're known for having surprises on your audiences. You're going to. Oh, this I? is <laughs> this is really unarticulated. Uh, no, actually, let me just check this out. Um, oh, perfect timing. <laughs> Uh, when you're looking for material to perform, is there anything you look for in particular, or just really things that I like? There's some a couple of Stevie Wonder tunes that I like, and uh, th but there's so many wonderful standard tunes that it's hard to get away from them. Mm -hmm. Although uh, you know, I played all the Beatles tunes and uh, Michelle Legrand, uh, a lot of things like, which I now I suppose they'd call them adult pop or something mm -hmm. like Evergreen and If and tunes like that. You know, you can't categorize them. There's a lot of very pretty tunes. Well, I know there's a wonderful songwriter by the name of Alec Wilder. Oh, you, well. You're very fond of Well, because Alec's music, it's a shame. It just never has been as popular to the average person as it should have been, yet everybody mm -hmm. knows his song, his, probably his best known song, I'll Be Around. But people sort of say, oh, who wrote that song? You know, Anquad, oh, yes. And it's too bad because that's one of the great songs, plus another one, While We're Young, beautiful song, and so peaceful in the country. And Alec and I were good friends, and he wrote, he used to write, like to write songs for his friends, not only for me, but for a lot of people. But uh, I played and recorded a mm -hmm. whole lot of them because I thought it would please him. And <laughs> And it did, actually. And uh, that, uh, this was a halcyon recording, and to my great surprise, the thing is still active and selling. And Alec Wilder fans are sort of like a cult, you know, they're all around mm -hmm. the place. Oh, absolutely. I hope you're one, too. <laughs> uh, you recently uh, performed with symphonies. Did mm -hmm. you find it hard going out of the nightclub setting? Well, the thing that was hard was that for a while I was playing some classics, doing Greek concerto. Mm -hmm. I, actually, I stopped doing that because <laughs> I just got so nervous. But uh, I'm sort of proud to have been able to play with a lot of very fine symphony orchestras, Rochester, Buffalo, and the Minnesota Orchestra, and here in New York with the New Amsterdam um, Symphony. In fact, we're doing another date with them in May. Um, it is different from nightclubs, but it, it, it's... They're, they're different, but they're all fun in their own way. And now that I'm playing more pop things for the symphony, like I've got an Alec Wilder selection and a Duke Ellington medley and a Gershwin and some of my own pieces, um, it's really a lot of fun to do, playing with a big orchestra. But I do like, I do like the freedom of nightclubs because if you, if you have two or three sets, if it doesn't make it the first set, you know you're mm -hmm. going to come back and have a second show. We haven't even talked about uh, Fat Tuesdays. That's coming up. You know, it's the, uh, the 30th of October. From through the 4th of through November. Through the 4th, yes. Yeah. It's a long time since I've worked in a club in New York because I've been at the Carlisle for mm -hmm. some time. So I really wanted to work in New York and see all my friends. And so I'm looking forward to this date very much. Well, I'm looking forward to you coming in here and you play. Great. It's been a pleasure, Marion. Thank you, Ryan. Really For me, too. Today. Thank you. If you have any comments or suggestions, you can write to myself. I'm Ryan Keating.
in care of Perot Productions, 640 10th Avenue, New York, New York, 10036. Until next week, this is Ryan Keating for Spotlight. Thanks Perfect. so much. <laughs>